when I decided that I really didn't want to work 70 to 100 markets a year anymore, I'd rather just focus on, you know, a handful of very large markets so that, you know, I could spend more time in the shop, I could make nicer stuff, I could get better at woodworking, and maybe I could focus more on making videos. I still needed a way to subsidize making these videos. So, one of the top sellers these past six, seven years that I've been working markets, I hate to say it, is probably the simplest thing I make these little tops and since i wasn't at the markets making them in front of people letting them color them selling them stuff like that i had to figure out a way to continue selling them so i decided I, this year i was going to try wholesaling them and i right now i have about a handful of toy stores selling them but i want to be able to expand that one so if you have a dozen or 20 or so stores you know maybe you can sell 30 40 tops a day to at least cover the basics of overhead of running a shop like this and a YouTube channel. The problem was how to do that one. You really need to be by the cash register for inexpensive impulse buys, especially at a toy store. Having tops over in the corner, you're just not going to sell that many. Plus the fact that maybe if I had a really nice display, I could sell, sell them at places other than tops. Who knows, that family bistro down the street? Need a little toy to keep the kids busy while the parents talk over dinner? A little top. So, something small that would catch attention and maybe serve another purpose that would want them to keep it by the register. Now, my brain has been going kind of bonkers trying to figure something up. I even came up with a three-tier setup where I had a bowl with a mirror on bottom, another bowl hovering up top to store tops, and then a little display and all that kind of stuff to grab people's attention. But my latest prototype was really just a small bowl that would hold about 30 tops and a little sign that the vendor could replace on a daily basis. Maybe put a pithy saying on, put the price of what they're selling the tops for, or daily specials, or just something to communicate that would be easily replaceable because this is basically just a bent business card. Just slides in there and stays in there with friction. The problem is, making one like this with the burnings and stuff like that, you know, that takes quite a bit of time. So, how could I mass produce a dozen of these so that I can send them out to my vendors? That's what we're going to do today. One of the main things I really like about this design is I included a message from me that everybody will be able to read. Handmade in Texas, yeah, that might boost up the value of them, but the fact that I also added an added message that it supports me as worth the effort in creating educational video content. And that might bring people to question, hey, what's he doing? Uh, and, you know, the owner or something like that says, oh, he runs a woodworking channel. Woodworking right there. The big issue like this is, with this design though, is it takes so much time to burn these letters, plus the fact that I kind of think it looks a little bit chintzy. It's a little bit, you know, craft show kind of stuff, and I'm trying to go a little bit above that aspect. Now my thinking of this is, maybe I could carve it. Carving would be a lot more elegant, and if these are being displayed, Maybe with my logo, my name on there, people will recognize, hey, it's a nice wooden bowl, and they might go to my website just to look at the bowls, maybe purchase them. So it could be kind of a marketing for that, too. Because, I hate to say it, you know, my YouTube, I'm, pop, I'm somewhat popular on YouTube, but I'm known more as an educator, and people are going to my site to learn to do stuff. And if they're learning to do it themselves, they're obviously not going to buy it from me. Maybe this will open up a little bit more of the market of people looking to me to actually buy bowls. So I want to have a very nice, elegant, made from a Texas wood bowl that somebody might want to put in their home. But it's also got to be small enough that it will encourage the retailers to keep it by the cash register. And it's got to be quick and easy for me to make. Because I really don't want to spend a lot of time or resources... It's something I'm giving away to a retailer where I'm not 100% sure they're going to leave it by the register. They might put it over in the corner so it won't do me any good. 
So, you know, kind of building it so that encourage the retailers to keep it there is an also aspect. That's why I wanted to make it nice. So if you're doing a lot of carving quickly, consistently, that's when you turn to the CNC's. Now at the moment, I don't have any nice Texas wood that I've harvested and been able to dry that will work for this purpose because I need some consistency when I'm doing batch production runs. I do happen to have this piece of poplar and it's a little bit bigger than I need and a lot wider than I need. I only need about eight, maybe ten quarter some uh, thickness in order to make this size bowl. But I think for a toy store where, you know, it's going to be a little bit more casual, this should work out okay. And this, you know, four-foot board should make me enough to satisfy all my toy stores at the moment. I also like it because when I picked it out, I got it so that the grain was fairly even and balanced. So, it goes all the way through. So, when I turn it, the color is going to be fairly consistent. And if you know Poplar... While it starts out green, after you put finish on it and put it out in the sunlight for a little while, it turns a nice brown. And I think that should look nice for a toy store application. Obviously, if I'm going to put it in a higher-end restaurant, I'll use something like mesquite or a pecan, something local that I've harvested. But the first thing I need to do is actually kind of dimension this a little bit. While working on the lathe, you does not demand perfect sizing. I mean, I put logs on there and those aren't consistent at all. Putting it on the CNC and getting a good carving demands some real flatness. So I am going to run this through the thickness planer, not my jointer at first. Then I will probably joint one side just to make it really straight so I can run it through my bandsaw to get the width that I want. And that should end up with something that's parallel sides that won't rock on my CNC machine. Now I did forget that when I originally set up the CNC I currently have, it was so that I could do this kind of carving on platters for like wedding gifts and stuff like that. And those kind of items are a lot lower. So I set it up so it could have a, do a maximum thickness of about two and a half inches underneath the router. This current blank is 12 quarters, so I'm going to have to cut it down to about a little over 2 inches. Either way, it's going to be a tad bit bigger than the prototype I did. So all i got to do is resaw off about an inch. Now, in the setup I use, I use Illustrator to come up with the artwork. That's just a standard vector art program. It draws with math instead of pixels. And here's the design I came up with. Now, this is going to be what they call V-carving. In that I'm not just going to a specific depth. I want to have the carving to look like, you know, somebody chip carved it with a knife or a chisel. So we use V-bits with this one. Now the problem is, normally when you do V-carving for like in signs and stuff like that, you have a nice flat surface. So as it goes down with a V-bit, it goes to a certain depth per width. But I'm going to be sticking this on a lathe. And one of the things I hate is a flat rim, and this carving is going to be going on the rim. So when I, I did the artwork, I actually had to make these two rings right here a lot bigger than I thought they should be. I mean, it looks kind of bold right here. But when you consider that I'm going to curve this outside a little bit, what's going to happen is I'm going to reduce the outside rim a little bit, and then as it dives into the interior of the bowl, this will get a lot thinner. So my hope is that I can get this one roughly a third less than this one so it will look right and look proper. Now you also notice that the font I used, there is no thin parts of it because if there is thin, any thin section, as I rounded it over, that would disappear. You see, the width of each one of these lines is made by how far down this bit goes into the wood. The deeper it goes, the wider the lines. But if I'm now going to make a narrow line and put it back in a lathe and curve it, as I bring remove more wood, the line will get thinner and thinner and thinner. So, I had to have a thick enough line so I can add the curves that I like so it will look and feel good, but still show up which also means I'm not going to be using the traditional 90 degree V-bit. I would prefer to have something a lot steeper. So I'm going to use a 60 degree V-bit so it will actually go down into the wood a lot farther for any given width. 
And that's why I came up with this design. Those fonts, that thickness. It's because I'm trying to plan to add curves into my bowl instead of just a flat surface this surface like most signs. And when you are V-carving, most people are doing signage. Now, the reason why I did it all in Illustrator is just because of my background. I feel I have a lot more control. I can work with all the kerning, the type, the way I want. It's just a much more powerful program for vector artwork. But what's really cool is I can now export as a SVG file that I can then import into the software that builds the G code for this machine. And the software I've been using for a little while now is Aspire, simply because I'm finding it gives me a lot more control and the carves come out quicker. It seems to get rid of a lot of the bogus stuff that a lot of the other uh, G-code creators were throwing in there. So next up is just loading up the G-code and starting everything up. And I'll be turning while this thing is carving. teachable moments kind of situations I think Paul Vermont might have been a poor choice here when I was doing the 60 degree bits like I wanted to so they would go a little bit deeper what was happening a lot of times when the letters got a little close uh, as in maybe a sixteenth of an inch between two parts of a letter at certain grain situations they were breaking off which means they won't work as as I intended uh, as an experiment I did about half of these with a 90 degree V bit so it just didn't go down as deep, thinking maybe if there was, wasn't as deep, there'd be more structure there so they just wouldn't break off. But they still somewhat broke off, and that 90 degree v, v bit wasn't as clean a cut. But we'll keep going to find how, the, how they come out. Uh, I did do an experiment with just some scrap piece of dried pecan, and the harder wood did so much better. But for toy stores, this should be okay. So the next step, let's get it out on the lathe. And to do that, we're going to be using my drive spur, which means I need to drill a pilot hole the size of the shank, but not the threads on this one. This goes into my uh, stronghold chuck, which is why in the artwork, I put a little center dot right there, and that will center my uh, lead on this screw, and that way I can be sure... that it will all be centered on my artwork. Then give the lettering just a nice coat of shellac to seal it up. Then it's just a matter of applying down some milk paint. I like milk paint just because it's easy to work with and it soaks into the wood. That way you can use different layers of colors and as that piece ages as the wood gets worn down, you'll get those colors laying out. That's one of the cool things about milk paint is that it does soak in. But that's also something I don't want to happen in this kind of situation. Because I don't want to bleed into the wood. So that's what that layer of slack was there for. And why am I applying it with a brush? Well, there's some letters where there's a little bit of tear out. And I want to make sure that that's not going to show up on the final piece. So instead of just kind of slathering on all over the place, this little brush allows me to control what letters it gets applied on at this point in time. Then I can turn it down and go back and apply it to the letters I missed by hand. 
and hopefully that tear out won't bleed through. I'm trying to correct the fact that I used popper instead of a, of a better wood for these first trial ones. <laughs> So what I did real quickly so that we can load it up is I put it on the screw chuck in that hole that we drilled earlier. I used these dividers to set the absolute, absolute minimum circle I could use to get my chuck into that recess right there. Now my chuck has some serrations on the outside which kind of makes it dovetailed. So as you put it into the hole, it's going to expand out into it a little bit. That's why you have to go really small and then expand out to the ideal circle of the chuck which has maybe a quarter inch gap in between each one of the jaws so i've got my dovetailed recess right here and i went ahead and squared it off to the size i want it for the entire bowls outside i also began removing a little bit of material in here now this is going to be what they call an og shape where the outside of the curt bowl is going to be right here and it's going to kind of curve in and then curve around to the bottom like that and I don't want to waste a lot of time doing layout. So a general trick on that one is to do it in two curves. If you have your total distance of the bowl right here, if I come over to about two-thirds in and I make one curve this way, very even, and then I can just round that out to the midsection on the bottom to create my balanced OG. So that's what we're going to do right now. Now I'm going to do up to this point on all the bowls just because this is one tool setting and I don't want to change the tool setting. And this isn't the final shape. This is a rough shape getting most of the material off when it was really securely uh, docked with that screw thread. So I'm going to do all the rest and then we'll come back, mount it, and do the interior. Now right now, all we are concerned with is getting a very rough shape. I'm not really worried about tear out or anything like that. Just getting the outside done. Because after that, it's just a matter of hollowing out the center and shaping the rim and a little bit of sanding. So right now that we've got all these to the OG shape we want, all I gotta do is remove this worm screw, rotate them around, and use a recess and make more mess. Now hollowing out a bowl isn't that difficult. The hard thing is not blowing out the sides or blowing out your bottom, which I sometimes do with uh, recesses like this. The thing is just turning up the speed you're comfortable at, watch your angles on your bevels, and then just start removing weight. Most of what you're doing is removing just the weight. You don't have to worry about thinning then just clean up top. Now 
Now with this particular design, I'm actually having multiple curves coming. The outside is going to be that kind of OG where it dips and then comes down then reverses around. The inside is just going to come straight down. And that OG works because the OG is handling the curvature of this rim that's just going to have our text on it. And then this curve is going to meet up with that bottom curve of the bowl. But in order to do that one, you can either invest in feeler gauge or something like that, or you can do what I call a head bob. And you, if you ever see me turn, I'm constantly doing this with my head. And it's one of those things where you can actually see both the edge and the outside at the same time. Let's see if I can show it to you. So we have the tip of my tool right there. If I come in and I can touch it right here, you know, I'm looking at this angle. But if I just rotate my head, I can kind of see in proportion where it is in relation to the outside. Because the tool isn't really moving, so I can picture where it's going to be. So then on that last cut, you just got to put a fresh edge on your tool. So you, you'll get the crisp of the line coming in. Pick it up. And shoot for maybe an eighth of an inch. Now this tool right here, the way I've got it cut with the 40-40 grind, it doesn't make that bottom cut very well. So, so then I'll go grab my uh, scraper, put a fresh burr on it, and just use it to clean up the bottom and transition it into that wall thickness very smoothly. The idea here is I don't want to sand as much as possible. There we go, let's see how we did. Uh, maybe a little tear out on the very bottom right there, but that's doable. So now, let's focus on the ever critical rim. Now this one is one of my practice ones. I am fully confident that I am going to try a shear scrape like I would with a normal very hard wood and it, sh it would work just fine but it might tear out some of the minor fibers here. So I'm probably going to go back and just sand this, uh, shape this with a sander to get my desired results simply because it's going to be a little bit more gentle with the more fragile fibers of the letters. But let's shear scrape it and see. And what do I mean by shear scraping? Well, I'm going to take the lower wing of my bowl gouge right here and have that present at less than 90 degrees. So it's a scraping action off the bottom wing. And then, instead of it being perpendicular, I'm going to raise it up at a shearing angle. So it's actually going to make somewhat of a slicing cut off of the lower wing. Just never touch the upper wing when you're doing this one because it could be a nasty catch. So I come over here, I present it low, a very light touch to lower it down, and then transition into the letters, go about two-thirds of the way up to the middle, and then right at about the two-thirds mark, I want to come over this side and lower this side down so that the high spot is at about the one-third of the way into the bowl. So I both dips away on the outside. There we go. So let's see what we got. And notice the interior line is going to be narrower. The exterior line is going to be a little bit thicker. And yet, can you see some of the letters are blowing out a little bit, but not so much. Maybe I'll do them all like that. Now just a little hand sanding and it should bring everything up nice and crisp. So there we go. Let's see how it turned out. Yeah, a little thin right there. I'll go back in and touch that up. Uh, eh. Well, now just to sand the interior and then I need to do the final shaping on the outside. And I'll show you the trick on that in a second. Okay, now I want to turn my attention back to this OG that I roughed out when it was flipped around. I was not looking for a perfect finish, just a rough shape. Because I didn't know how thick this would be. And I'm actually 
somewhat okay with the thickness of this rim right there. I think it feels good. So I'm going to come in just a tad bit and then lower this curve a little bit more and then even that out so that the shape will blend more with the interior right here which these two meet right about there it's about a quarter of an inch so I can scoop this out a little bit more to get a better transition I like leaving this to last whenever I do recess bowls because I can still get my tool fairly deeply in here Now here's a second bowl where I blew through that inner circle a little bit. So I thought I'd show you how I've been fixing it. I got a cheap skew that I don't use for anything other than making these little V scrapes. So I'll come on in here, turn it up, and I'm actually going to take out that interior one. Reestablish that circle. And then drop a very fine sharpie in it and just draw it. And unless you point it out to somebody, nobody's going to know that, that that was not painted versus the one that was normal. One of my pet peeves about wood turning is those people that don't finish the bottom of their project. I mean, make the bottom as nice as everything else, plus the fact if you can hide any evidence of how you actually held the work to actually do the, do the carving, it adds a bit of mystique to the projects, I think. So, hey, might as well make it look like you're doing black magic at all possible, right? Now, whenever I remove, dress up the bombs, a lot of times some woods will react with these jumbo jaws, them being aluminum and the rubber. And this is pretty much close to how I want to add finish to it. So putting a paper towel between it and the base kind of adds just a tad bit of protection so that the end product will look okay. And I want to go back and fix it up again. Not too bad, huh? And the last little bit is putting a little hole in one of the O's for a pin so we can put the sign on them. Now I am in a bit of a rush that these, these first four need to go out uh, today. So uh, let's go ahead and check out what it's going to look like with a little finish on them. My go-to finish for this kind of stuff has always been a little walnut oil. This one's from Mahoney. It's a little bit of process, but it is 100% walnut oil. Just a little dab on there. Uh, the first time you do it will really soak it in. If I were just sell, selling these bowls or if I had a little bit more time, I would basically oil it once per day for a week and then once a week for a month and then once a month for a year. But we don't have, quite have that amount of time. So we'll just give it a good slathering on. I'll put it in the oven overnight to help it cure a little faster and it'll be off to the customers in the morning. The last step is making little flags. They'll go into the little hole I put into one of the O's and it'll let me advertise the price for them or any other message. These are just samples I give to them whenever I make my cold call selling. Uh, and then in the mail when I send them their first batch of tops, I'll give them a custom one with their logo and whatever price that they want to put on it. It also gives them a spot to put any kind of daily message they want 
with a little slot I cut into the very top. Easy to set up and I think I like this a little bit better than my original design because the flag can be moved around and swapped out fairly easily for new ones if they ever want a new message there. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I kind of learned that I am not going to be doing uh, Poplar very often. I didn't really like it in the turning aspect, and I definitely did not like it in the letter carving aspect. But for this initial batch of toy stores, it should work out okay. And I hope you enjoyed this little experiment of mine of making a little display. And if you did, please do me a favor. Like, favorite, subscribe. Do all those social medias. Visit my website, WorthEffort.com. Where not only do I write a fairly frequent blog, but I also have a line of swag such as t-shirts, hats, I also sell shop made tools, and some of my own word work such as bowls and boxes and stuff like that. And all those sales are how I subsidize making this content for y'all. And I want you to remember after all that one last thing. That it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.